protecting vaccines. My name's Kate and I'm on the team here at Lung Health Foundation, um, but I myself am definitely not an expert, um, but I am someone who is living with lung disease. I am mom to a little girl who has asthma, so I just want to say I'm with you. I understand coming into infectious respiratory illness season with some anxiety, and I'm always looking for ways to protect myself and to protect my family. So I think that's why you are here too, to get some answers to your questions about um, the most commonly recommended kind of lung protecting vaccines that can help you stay safe um, this season and reduce your risk of getting sick. Um, we got some really great questions from you during registration, but if you do have another question, I definitely encourage you to put it in the Q&A box. Um, and if we don't get to it today during this session, we are going to be sending out a follow-up email that's going to have a combination of answers to some of those questions we couldn't get to and some really helpful links to programs and services um, from Lung Health Foundation, from our partners at Rexall, et cetera, um, who, you know, these links can help you kind of navigate this increased anxiety time of year. Um, we will also be sharing some poll questions in just a moment. They are anonymous, but they really help us to shape our future content. So we would love to see some answers to those as well. I'm going to go ahead and turn those on right now. Um, so I'm joined today by not one, but two certified respiratory educators. I'm joined by Jazdev Singh, who is a Rexall pharmacist, and Diane Feldman, who is a registered respiratory therapist here at the Lung Health Foundation. If you've ever called our free lung health line, you've probably spoken with Diane. And if you've ever used one of Rexall's amazing virtual services, there's a very good chance that you've talked to Jazdev as well. Um, so we promise you answers to your questions and I'd like to dive right in. So welcome to our two guest speakers. We're going to start off with whoever asked this question. It's a really, really good one to get us started. So thank you. Um, Diane, what does immunization have to do with lung health? Why are we having this conversation? Immunization has everything to do with lung health. I mean, when you're talking about protecting lung health, whether or not you're a healthy person with lung health or somebody who is managing a lung disease, being armed with, with vaccines and, and preventive um, measures is, is, is key to protecting your lung health. So really about stopping the problem before it starts, hopefully. Prevention is is worth the pound of cure. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Um, so second question, um, we got a bunch of variations of this. I think people are just looking for some straightforward information about which vaccines is LHF um, suggesting that people consider, um, but which vaccines should I consider if I have a lung disease? I'll open this question up to both of you. It's a good one. Yeah, definitely. Um, the more vaccines you can get, the better in terms of protecting against infections. But the common ones that we we kind of experience, um, especially in the community setting, are interests for the likes of the COVID booster, the va vaccination for influenza, also the pneumonia vaccines, RSV now has become available. Uh, so these are commonly circulating kind of vaccines that we're seeing in the community and within our pharmacies as well. And they definitely help to prepare the body for any exposure to these particular infections that are prevalent this time of year. So there's a lot of uh, increase in infections during the winter months, especially at the moment, there's uh, reports suggesting an increase in, in numbers of infections as well. So coming up to the, the holiday season, uh, we're getting together, there's a lot more uh, interaction, social events, and, and that's generally where the uh, risk is at its highest. So considering those types of vaccines would definitely help to give your body the pr preparation it needs into these um, high risk months there. Um, but not to forget about the extra vaccines like the DTAP as well, which can help um, prepare one for those types of infections too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we just shared a really great resource that Rexall has, just an easy to use kind of guide to a bunch of different vaccines, not just ones concerned with lung health. We also have um, some immunization web content on lunghealth.ca that's going to help you 
kind of understand from a lung health perspective, which we would kind of recommend considering. And um, we're going to get into some of the really specifics about a few of those. I know we've got tons of questions about RSV because it's kind of the new kid on the block in terms of, you know, protection that you can um, expect this year through a vaccine. Um, but uh, I'm going to go ahead to one of our questions that came in during registration, and a few people had the same concern, so I think it's one that we all share. If you are recovering from COVID-19, you've had it recently, you're just getting over it, um, should you avoid any vaccines after recovery? If so, how long? Anything special you need to kind of keep in mind? I think that as soon as you feel well enough, as soon as you feel well enough and you are you past the COVID symptoms, um, you can you can go ahead and get any of the other vaccines except for COVID vaccine itself. The COVID vaccine, if you've had COVID, you probably have a little bit of protection from the antibodies that your body has built up against COVID. So there there is a grace period that you probably are somewhat protected from COVID because you've had COVID. Um, the grace period is about three to six months. So depending on um, your level of severity of your illness and, and your risk of, of developing any kind of uh, further complications as a result of an infection, you may want to speak with your healthcare provider about whether or not you should get another vaccine at three months, or you can afford to wait further down the line for, uh, for six months. But any of the other vaccines are, are fair game. So that's the flu vaccine, pneumonia vaccine and the RSV vaccine. Right. And the specific audiences for each of those that Diane just mentioned, you can find those on lunghealth.ca slash immunization, because it's my understanding that some of them are suggested for certain age groups or risk factors. Maybe we can get into that in just a moment. But so what I'm hearing is when you are well enough, you are done kind of quarantining from your COVID-19 infection, um, you're back on your feet. So it sounds like from your perspective, there's no there's no reason to avoid getting out and getting that flu shot that you've been avoiding or your RSV vaccine. Um, and in fact, I'm looking at the calendar. It's like coming up on mid-December. And I don't know about you guys, but I'd really like to bring in 2024 as healthy as possible. Um, how long does it take to kind of be protected after you get one of these vaccines? Usually it's around two weeks, uh, what we recommend. So at least two weeks before uh, traveling, for example, or um, coming into contact with, with risks for these types of infections. So generally it's about a two week window for the immunity to kind of set in and for your body to prepare the antibodies required to, to offer that level of protection that's needed. So uh, this time of year is a prime time to get those vaccines or at least could consider those vaccines with the anticipated peak uh, towards the end of this holiday season. Uh, so uh, thinking about it right now is the best time to, to, to get the most from these types of vaccines. Awesome. I love the message that it's not too late. If you've been putting mm -hmm. it off, in fact, I would imagine if you are here with us today, it's probably because you have at least one that you haven't gotten yet. But two weeks, two weeks to protection. That's really good news. Um, let's talk about side effects. We had a couple variations of this question as well. It's on people's minds. Um, so what are the most common side effects reported um, just generally with vaccines? Um, and kind of a more of a specialized question, um, what is Guillain-Barre syndrome and how rare is it? So I'm assuming that's some kind of side effect sometimes reported. Let's tackle most common, because I think those are the ones that we are expecting to see. So the most common is probably just localized arm pain. You know, somebody might get some fever for 24 hours or so. Um, that's probably the biggest reaction that you may get from, from getting the flu vaccine. Other, vac uh, other side effects like the Guillain-Barre syndrome is extremely rare. And, the, and, and I can't stress enough that it's very rare. And the reason to get a flu vaccine to protect yourself from getting the flu is more important than, than um, the, the possibility of, a, of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. It is a type of paralysis, but, but um, people who are concerned about anything regarding side effects should really contact their healthcare provider and speak to the healthcare provider 
provider about their own personal uh, perspective and experience. Yeah, and a lot of these uh, side effects are, are self-limiting in most cases. So as uh, Dan mentioned about the fever, the localized pain, they are products that can be used over the counter to help um, minimize some of the risks of side effects. And it also depends on individual risk as well. Like uh, Dan mentioned, everyone has a different response to medication, even vaccinations. Some individuals may not experience anything at all. Others may have the fever and the localized pain. So preparing yourself with the likes of Tylenol, if you're able to take it, can help offset some of the discomfort following any immunization. Also with any fever that may set in after the in injection as well, that can offer some relief, um, along with maintaining adequate hydration, um, ensuring that you're not stopping your day-to-day -day activities, because that's when you generally start to notice these adverse effects more. Just continuing on as you normally would uh, is the best way to get through that 24, 48 hour period after any immunization. So really comes down to kind of being prepared, being mm. prepared. Awesome. Um, let's get into some more specifics. So this is a question about the flu. We hear this one a lot. How effective is the flu shot uh, at preventing cases of the flu? So the flu elevates your protection against getting the flu. It also provides you with something called herd protection, so that if you get the flu, if you get the flu vaccine and you're protected, you're protecting others around you from developing um, the flu as well. And so that's very, uh, very important in terms of you know grandparents, seniors, you know who are looking after maybe small children, grandchildren. Um, the herd, herd immunity is very important in terms of the whole picture of just not protecting yourself, but also protecting other people around you. The, um, the, not every vaccine is perfect. So even if you do get the flu from after having the flu vaccine, you probably will get um, a lesser evil of the flu. You probably will have fewer symptoms. Your recovery time will be less. Yeah, reducing the risk for hospitalization is always uh, a benefit to these types of vaccines too. So um, with the influenza vaccine, it will contain uh, the common strains anticipated for the flu season. So with the virus itself, it can change its structure. So getting it bang on on the nose, trying to figure out which ones will be prevalent is very difficult to do, but it's based on uh, trends that have been identified throughout the course of the year in other countries, and it's developed to help uh, target those common strains that's anticipated. But as Dan mentioned, it will also reduce the risk for severity with any additional strain that's encountered because your body's prepared to recognize uh, the virus there. So it's not necessarily um, perfect bulletproof protection, but in terms of preventing a hospital visit during the holidays mm -hmm. or throughout the year or preventing um, you know, all of those secondary nasties that can come with a serious flu infection, I'm hearing that it's absolutely worth it. Um, okay, so now that we know we can't prevent every single case of the flu, um, this question came in from someone who is wondering, hey, they got the, they got the vaccine, they still ended up with the flu, what can they do to take care of themselves at home uh, when they come down with the flu? Basically, analgesics like Tylenol or Advil, staying home and resting. I always advocate, you know, lots of liquids. You know, I like chicken soup. <laughs> That's always good. good. Um, lots of rest, you know, trying to protect yourself from others and them from you as much as possible until you start feeling a little bit better. Yeah, and paying attention to the public health um, notices as well in the area. Uh, can give you an insight into the trends that's been identified within that community setting. Uh, so it can help you get ahead of the game and, and be prepared for those risks ahead. And also the likes of ventilation when at home, obviously weather permitting, just having that flow of, of clean air coming through can help to eradicate some of that uh, residual virus um, in, in the air. And also just keeping um, keeping hydrated, we can't, can't stress how important that is. Sometimes when you're feeling ill, you're not up to eating as much, but dehydration is always a risk. So maintaining good hydration, electrolytes uh, when necessary um, is always a good way to help with recovery too. 
Right. So again, a little bit of planning, a little bit of taking care of yourself never hurts to hydrate. Um, okay, so uh, another flu specific question or flu vaccine specific question. Um, what if someone has an allergy to the flu vaccine? And I'm just going to tack on because there's a great question in the Q&A. Um, and what about um, vaccines for people with known autoimmune conditions? So allergies and autoimmune conditions. Um, how does our approach change? I think the best answer really is to speak with the healthcare provider at that point about the specific situation because uh, they know you, your, they know your situation and they know you best. Whether or not there's an allergy that prevents you from getting the flu vaccine safely, there are very few people that cannot take the flu vaccine safely. And so you need to know what it is that you're allergic to and what are the ingredients in that vaccine that, that um, May, may or may not really play into the problem that you're having with that allergy. Autoimmune disease, again, when you're talking about trying to prevent infection, the reason to do something is it has to outweigh the reason not to do something. So arming yourself against infection, whatever you can do to try and prevent um, uh, infection from happening is very important. So speak to your healthcare provider about your specific situation. Yeah, they may have recommendations for timing, like whether it's worth deferring for a little while, depending on any treatments that are being undertaken. So definitely connect with your healthcare provider. Um, as Dan mentioned, they'll know the ins and outs to your medical history there. Uh, another question from registration. I just turned 65 and a friend said I should do the high dose flu shot. Um, what's the difference and does that mean that the side effects are worse? Good question. So with the high dose uh, vaccine, it has a high potency of the, uh, the antigen in there to help spike the immune response. So uh, once you hit the age of 65 and over, uh, one, the risk for infections is greater, but also the uptake of uh, vaccinations is slightly less. So having that higher dose can help promote and and reach and achieve that um, the optimal response following the vaccination. So it's uh, it's what's needed to get your levels to where it needs to be to offer the the relevant protection there. Uh, in terms of side effects, uh, again, it's case to case. So some individuals will have a higher side effect risk with this standard dose. Others will be fine with the high dose. So it's very difficult to say if there is going to be a greater chance. But theoretically speaking, there would be an increased risk for a bit of fatigue, a bit of soreness, uh, a bit of fever following those. Uh, immunization. So having the preparations in place, as we discussed earlier, um, having that good meal before going into the uh, immunization there will help to kind of get your body ready for the vaccine ahead and improve recovery following. Um, so I'm assuming I'm well, good question for you, a pharmacist, but um, are the high dose ones in shorter supply? Like, let's say someone can't get the higher dose what should their tactic be? What would you mm. recommend? Um, well, it's important to get vaccinated at the appropriate time. So with the anticipated peak ar arriving, if it's uh, an availability concern where the high dose is not available at your local pharmacy, you've tried a few and it's not uh, available to you at that moment in time. So Rexo does aim to provide both options. Um, I wouldn't defer vaccination just in hopes of it getting the higher dose one at a later time, it's better to get some protection in and build those antibodies and protect yourself in the lead up to the peak. So uh, don't put it off just because it's not available at this time. The standard dose would still be considered an appropriate option. So talking about the peak, we're talking about a bit of a peak of cases of infectious respiratory illnesses. Is that, that kind of what we're getting at here? When are we thinking that's gonna be? Yep. So there's been an increased trend noted over the last couple of weeks, and that's uh, expected to spike for the holiday season. Um, so within the next two to three weeks um, is generally when the case is at the highest. Hospitalization rates have also shown an increased trend over the last little while there. Uh, so another reason why it's very important to at least consider these vaccinations. Uh, they're not mandatory by all means, but they're definitely recommended to help reduce uh, complications following any infection. So um, just getting your body ready to deal with any 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 associated risk in the weeks or the months ahead there. So the flu season can last on into the new year. So it's not, even though the peak may be considered for now, 
uh, there have been times where the season is extended depending on uh, the prevalence of infections, the uh, weather as well can play an impact on it. So definitely keeping up to date with the trends and the public health announcements is, is key, especially this time of year. Okay, so we have kind of a little bit, I'm, I'm going to make a connection to one of the questions that we have in the chat, because it's really about that, you know, gathering with folks, um, they are wondering, they've got their flu shot, they've got their COVID shots up to date. Um, do they need to be concerned when people come into their home? Um, they note that many people they know are not getting vaccinated either. So they have been asking them to mask up. And I guess this person's just looking for a little bit of um, clarification. I know, um, there aren't as many kind of public announcements about what the expectation should be around masks. Um, you know, should this person be concerned? Is there anything else that they can do to protect themselves? Um, so I'm going to throw that, that question out there. Really good one. I think it's a great question. And I don't know that we have a specific response to it, except that you're doing whatever you can to protect yourself in terms of the vaccination, in terms of masking and so on. And asking people, you know, whether or not they have um, gotten their vaccinations ahead of time, if um, if they can prove that they don't have COVID by doing a rapid antigen test before they come into your home, uh, wearing a mask if necessary. Um, public health really leaves a very open-ended, um, individualized decision for people. They give the mandate and they give the overall protect. Um, um, advice, but then it becomes in, uh, it becomes important for the person to make their own personal decision as to whether or not they feel that the risk is worth it. I guess it depends also on how many people are coming into the home during the holiday, um, whether or not the people are known to them or whether or not these are you know people they don't really see that often. Um, I don't know whether or not uh, you have something else to say. Maybe yeah. My yeah, I can also um, inquire with the individual before they come over if they're feeling well in themselves. So that's an easy recognition. Like if they're feeling under the weather, encourage them to defer meeting or arranging a, another date that's uh, better uh, time-wise. Um, cleansing and disinfecting high touch areas like door handles can also help prevent the spread of infection. So although the signs and symptoms may not be visible, we can spread the, the infections through close contact. So uh, maintaining good hand hygiene before eating, making sure you're washing your hands, and that will prevent the spread of infections, um, avoiding touching the face where possible, especially if you're out in a public setting, making sure that you're utilizing the hand sanitizers, washing your hands where you can be when you return home. Uh, and then just having that conversation, just um, seeing how the individual's feeling that all the people coming over are feeling in themselves and, and just using a bit of uh, a bit of awareness to those um, th those early signs that we can detect and kind of intervene from. So, yeah. Let's normalize staying home when you're sick. Yeah. Please. <laughs> um, we're going to switch gears a little bit. So I promised some information about RSV. RSV, uh, lots of questions came in. Um, a lot of folks are wondering, um, well, everything about this. So um, our first question is, um, what, what is RSV? Um, and why is it a concern, particularly for older adults? So I'm going to take a stab at what is RSV. And it stands for respiratory syncytial virus. And it is a virus like the flu virus, influenza virus that can float, you know, around and, and sometimes uh, people may have developed an infection. They may actually have had RSV when they thought that it was the flu, the flu, uh, the flu. And so now the whole the whole focus of it in the media is that there's a vaccine that's available for seniors who are um, older people and also maybe immunocompromised. They can have access to getting a vaccine. And so it was. It's always been around. In most cases, it can be a mild infection, but in some cases it may be very severe. And so again, when we're talking about immunization and protecting yourself from, that, uh, from infections, this type of vaccine may be very beneficial too. 
Um, so symptoms are very similar to other infections. You'll have the likes of a cough, wheezing, difficulty breathing. So there's a lot of overlap in, in symptoms. So it's difficult to know which strain of infection that you may have. Um, the thing that we've noticed nowadays is we're seeing a lot more of the way of testing for this type of infection. So I think that's showing how common it is in circulation. So it tends to follow the pattern of uh, the COVID influenza type season. So during the winter months tends to be the highest uh, numbers for these types of cases. So the vaccine, yes, it is new. It, it does offer the protection uh, against it. So it helps in those individuals with underlying risk factors. So those with respiratory conditions, immunocompromised states, it helps to reduce the risk for hospitalization, uh, how severe the outcome is following the, in, the infection itself. So similar to the other vaccinations we've touched on, the concept is the same. It helps to prepare the body um, for those exposures in the future there. So at the moment, because it's still relatively new, the long-term protection is still being assessed for. So at the moment, it has been stated for up to two years, um, but that could change, similar to how the shingles vaccine changed. With time studies come out, we realize protection has been extended. Uh, so it's still something to kind of watch for um, in terms of long-term effect for these vaccines, but um, it will definitely be out in the media whenever we hear more of that. So there's always uh, the access to healthcare providers. If you have any specific questions to any of these vaccines, RSV included, if there's a bit more information or specifics that you have um, interest for, just reach out to someone. They'll be able to answer the questions or at least point you in the right direction so you can get the uh, information you need prior to considering something like this. And a little bit of a follow-up question just while we're talking RSV. Um, is this the same RSV? I know anyone who's had um, young children in their family in the last few years, um, well, almost ever, has been concerned about RSV for their infants. Is this the same virus that... Um, is potentially a concern for our older family members as well. It's the same. It is the same. And hopefully in the future, there will be a vaccine for uh, younger children as well. Okay. But currently, the RSV vaccine that is new for this year is for our friends, uh, I believe it's 60 and older. I believe, um, yes, I think it was 60 and over and also people who may be immunocompromised, they can be, they can ask about the RSV. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Now we have, we do have on lunghealth.ca slash immunization, a little bit more about um, recommended audiences um, for each of these vaccines. Um, Follow-up question, where and how do I get the RSV vaccine? So the RSV. So current, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'll let you. So so currently, all the other, the other vaccines are available in the pharmacy, and you can just go in and make an appointment and go to the pharmacy like in, like Rexall Pharmacy. But with the RSV right now, um, what you have to do is get a prescription from your healthcare provider, go to the pharmacy and get the the uh, the vaccine, and then take it back to the healthcare provider to administer it. It's a few extra steps. And there are um, expand, expanded scopes of practice now for healthcare providers like pharmacists. So uh, immunizations are being um, administered within the pharmacy setting. More and more injections are being seen through our pharmacies. So depending on province as well, whichever province you're in, the recommendations are slightly different. Um, but if you are interested in the RSV vaccine, you could also reach out to your, your local pharmacist uh, and they can help set up a, 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 an immunization kind of recommendation to the physician and request a prescription that way. Um, so that can help sometimes cut out the the steps there. Uh, just just connect with the team member and we can, uh, you know, take down some information, what you're interested in. If it's more than one vaccine type, we can then send a recommendation out to the physician there and then wait on that prescription to come back. Um, and then we can also request for um, administration um, directives as well. So that can sometimes allow for certain things to be done um, within the pharmacy setting. So that might help to streamline some of the process. It, has, it is different out here in Alberta. If there's anyone who's watching from this area, um, prescribing pharmacists are available to support with any um, Schedule One prescriptions other than narcotics, vaccines included. Um, so that's expected to kind of branch out to the rest of the country. So there will be more and more access to health um, information and also health uh, products through the pharmacy setting to reduce some of the burden on the healthcare streams there. 
upgrades. So I'm hearing kind of no matter which province you're in, your local pharmacist is going to be the best source of information for what the mechanism is for getting it in your mm-hmm. jurisdiction. Cause it sounds like it's different kind of from place to place. Yeah. And we can help set that up as well. So uh, it doesn't mean you have to wait several weeks for a doctor's appointment. We can look to fax across a requisition uh, for this, this particular product and, and arrange for it that way. Great. And um, so RSV vaccine, will it make me feel sick after I get it? It's possible. It's, uh, you know, you may have the same types of side effects that you have from the flu vaccine, from a pneumonia vaccine, from the COVID vaccine. It could make you uh, have some, you may have some arm pain. You may have a little bit of fever. Again, you can take some analgesics like Tylenol or Advil. Um, and just usually the side effects will pass after 24 hours. Yeah, a lot of the side effects are very similar across vaccinations. It's the, the way the body prepares itself and starts to interact with the vaccine to, to build those antibodies. So some of these will be, um, you know, very similar across different vaccine types. So um, preparation is key again. With the RSV vaccine, um, there is a cost associated with it. So can we have a really quick discussion on, um, you know, what we can do if that's a barrier or, you know, how we can kind of approach that knowing that for now there is a cost associated with it? Yep, and cost varies from uh, province to province and also uh, individual factors as well, like if there's any private medical coverage in place. So the costs that one will be paying may differ from another individual. So because it's not publicly funded, um, there is the cost associated with it. But if you are inquiring about how much it will cost yourself, particularly, again, reach out to one of the pharmacy team members and they can just see if it is an eligible benefit under the plan um, or even reach out to your plan provider. Um, That will be a good way to kind of get some more information on how much it's going to cost potentially. Um, And then also in regards to the base price, it's going to be around the the 250 to 300 mark, depending on um, province that you're in and the cost of medicines there. Okay. Um, We're going to switch gears. We're going to ask a couple questions about the pneumococcal pneumonia vaccine. Um, First of all, you know, what what is pneumococcal pneumonia um, and who should consider getting the vaccine for it? So pneumococcal uh, pneumonia is a bacterial type of pneumonia. There is a uh, there is a vaccine. Depending on who you are, how old you are, what your situation is, will determine what type of vaccine is most uh, um, advised for you. So younger children and uh, six months and up will have a certain type of pneumonia vaccine. Um, for older people, whether or not they've had a vaccine in the past and their specific situation in terms of lung disease and and, and whether or not uh, they need another one. Again, best to speak to the healthcare provider that you're dealing with to get your story and, and get an understanding of what should, what should follow. There are many different uh, pneumonia vaccines available now on the market. And, and it's, it's really the protocol should be followed by um, your specific situation as to which one is best for you. So it's not quite as straightforward as, you know, I, I know I go in yearly in October, November, I get my flu shot. Um, I'm hearing that it's a little bit, there's a little bit more of extra consideration there depending on your on your history. Well, my understanding is the newest one is the Prevnar 20. And my understanding of Prevnar 20 is that once you've had it, you're done that you the, basically the recommendation at this point in time is that if you get Prevnar 20, you will not need another vaccine. But having said that, things can change, protocols and, and advice can change. And so what I'm saying right now today is true today and may, may change in the future. But again, like you said, Kate, there are many different vaccines available against pneumonia and people should speak to their healthcare provider about which one is best for them and get one. Yep. And we offer um, a service within Rexall 
which comes under the vaccination assessment. So we can kind of review um, vaccination history if you have it to hand. Some provinces have access to it. You can also access it through digital uh, health records through your mobile device or smart uh, devices there. And we can go through, break down the recommendations, reference it to the recommendations at this point, whether it's uh, through Health Canada guidelines, uh, CDC, and we can help to make an informed decision on, on what's best for that individual. So that's another question or another uh, service that's provided. So we can definitely go through, work out which ones are required and help uh, establish the, the process for getting those done as well. So. Great. Um, another question, um, which of these vaccines can I get at the same time? So a little bit of a question about spacing. Yeah, a lot of the vaccines nowadays are available together. So it is all on preference as well. So there is an increased risk for possible fatigue following immunizations if there's multiple ones done together um, because they all have a very similar side effect profile. So the, the risk for an increased uh, side effect response is there. Um, but that's also individual basis. Some people will have several together and be totally fine. Others may have just the one vaccine and feel run down for a day or so. So there's a lot of um, considerations to be made, but in theory, uh, the ones that we've just touched on can be co-administered. So for convenience, if that's something that's a, a constraint at this time, you can set up a time to come in and have the, the, the three of them done together. So COVID flu and pneumonia as well. Okay, so that might be good, good advice for someone who is trying to get themselves um, to max protection as soon as possible, but it sounds like, like, like a lot of things, your healthcare provider is kind of your first step for information and personalized advice. Mm -hmm. Um, so jumping back to RSV, is that a yearly vaccine? I believe it's uh, good for two years. So when you have been admitted, you uh, received the, uh, RSV vaccine, it is it effective for two years. And there's no, from what I'm aware, there's no recommendations for a booster just yet. Um, so it's just a one-time thing for now, but that once again could change with time and further understanding of how it's protecting in the long run. Mm. And are there any specific impacts of RSV for someone who has um, COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Is there anything that, um, what's the effect on an existing condition like that? Well, it can create a flare-up. So it's it's like any other virus, you know. So it can be pneumonia. You talk about pneumonia, talk about flu, talking about RSV, talking about uh, what's the oh COVID, of course. I forgot COVID. Um, anything that that um, impacts impacts you know your respiratory system can create a flare-up for COPD. People with COPD, people with asthma, should all have written action plans. And uh, if you don't know what a written action plan should be, you know, you can call the lung line. I'm happy to talk to you about what a lung, what an action plan should contain. And it's an, it's like a traffic light. It's set up green, yellow, red, telling you, you know, what your own set of normal situation is in the green zone. When you're starting to get into trouble, not to wait beyond a certain length of time before you seek medical attention and make changes to whatever the action plan is advising you to do. So going back to your original question, it can, it can create an exacerbation of COPD, which is something that is desirable to prevent. Yeah, and not just COPD, also the likes of asthma and um, there's also been increased pneumonia admissions with um, individuals that have uh, had RSV as well, uh, congestive heart failure. There's been increased admissions for that as well. So if there's that cardiac element too, um, it can have an effect on those uh, health systems as well. So definitely um, knowing what's available and considering these types of vaccines will show some benefit for preventing some of those. So preventing some of those flare-ups, preventing the hospitalization risks associated with these types of infections and even secondary infections that can happen following a, 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 a first set of infection. This is great. I'm kind of taking notes for myself too, because my life with asthma, I find, you know, I, I might have the initial illness and then, you know, that flare-up can 
kind of last long beyond uh, beyond the illness. And I have an asthma action plan, and I know when I need to kind of bump up my therapy. So um, one-on-one advice from one person with asthma to another, if that is you, uh, if you have COPD, I am a strong believer in asthma and COPD action plans for mm-hmm. exactly this kind of thing. Yeah, and if there's um, additional information that's required, um, and it's specific to respiratory conditions as well. You can always reach out through the Rexel website and set up for a respiratory assessment. So that's something that we provide here through Rexel, and it breaks down the conditions that's being treated for the medications, whether there's an action plan, whether there's recommendations for vaccinations, and also work with the individual there to establish goals for the long run to better manage their health condition overall. Um, So feel free to utilize these free services. It's available for that reason, just to improve um, control overall for these types of conditions and prevent any complications in the long run. So yeah, don't ever hesitate to reach out to any healthcare provider. That's what we're trained for, just to support where we can. And Diane, you probably get lots of questions like that with the Lung Health Line as well. That's why we're here, right? We're here to empower you, to manage your health, um, and to prevent prevent flare-ups yeah okay we're going to switch gears to a question we just got in through the chat um and um to this person if we cannot answer i would like to get you an answer because i'm curious as well so this person asks a healthcare professional told me the covid tests we have available to us do not detect the new variant is that true We might need to get back to you on that one. Yeah, I'll have to look into that to see if there has been. Because we've also noticed that with time, there's been less in the way of testing. So that could also be uh, mm. something to kind of consider for. So it's definitely something we can look into and, and see if there is a uh, an accurate answer that we can provide. And so I don't, you know, I don't have a specific answer to that question, but I would go back to the basics of preventing infection. And so... In the end, does it matter what variant it is? Because how meaningful is that going to be to your case? So, you know, if it's variant, so what? And basically what you're trying to do is prevent flare up from COVID, from, from pneumonia, from RSV and from flu. Right, so it's not necessarily terribly important which one you have at that particular time, um, they share a lot of symptoms. I think that, you know, in terms of the variant, it's important to the researchers to develop another vaccine, especially against COVID. It's important for them to know what variant is floating around so that they can develop another vaccine that will protect against those variants of COVID. But the end user, all they want to know is that they're protected against those infections. For sure. Um, So I'd like to spend, if anyone has any more Q&As, get them in that question box now, because we are going to wrap up soon. Um, But we got a few variations of this question, so I thought it would be a good one to kind of close out our formal questions. Um, This person is feeling like it's, you know, I'm going to quote them their words, just too many vaccines. What advice would you have for someone who is feeling overwhelmed by all of the different possibilities, especially as we start getting into, you know, there's these different, there's, you know, these four different conditions, and then there's these sub kind of products within those conditions. Someone's feeling overwhelmed, what should they be doing? I think having an awareness around the options available is always key to start with. But with that, you start to ask more and more questions about the effectiveness, uh, whether it's appropriate for yourself. Um, so that's a prime opportunity to connect with a healthcare provider, or connect with a pharmacist, connect with a specialist in this area, um, connect with the Lung Health Foundation, just to kind of answer those concerns that you may have. So we can always re- regroup and address those specifics for your particular case. So um, utilize that, that ability there. So there's a lot of information that we've shared in this um, short period of time, but there are going to be follow-up questions and that's what we're here to, to support with. So. Uh, don't ever be frightened to ask a question because that's what we're prepared for. That's what we're trained for. And as I said earlier, if we can't answer it in that moment of time, we can always uh, get back to you or refer you if needs be to someone who's more appropriate in that that field of topic. 
don't be afraid to reach out guys truly um you know organizations like the ones in front of you and your local pharmacist and your healthcare provider they're all there to help you figure and out and i think this out. you know the the overwhelming part is that there are so many vaccines suddenly available i mean 2 years ago 3 years no 4 years ago we only had to worry really about um the flu the flu shot and pneumonia vaccine but now, because of COVID, now we have to worry about the COVID vaccine. Now we have an, an RSV vaccine. So it can seem like it's very confusing and overwhelming, but really all of those vaccines are here to protect you from getting sick. Yeah, we have more protective options than we had before. Yeah, research has advanced with time and that's gonna open up the door to access to these types of uh, preventative medicines. Yeah, I know the RSV vaccine has been um, one that's been, you know, scientists, researchers have been trying to solve that for a very, very long time. So, um, you know, 2023 is 2023 is the year. So um, I would definitely recommend people to ask their healthcare providers which which they need and get some personalized advice. Um, sorry, a question just came in. I think this is a really important one. Is there an age-based recommendation guide for any of these vaccines that could be shared? So let's talk about age Health groups. Can Health Canada is always a good, a good uh, reference point. It's recommended within Canada for the risks that are associated for Canadians. Uh, so that's a good uh, quick reference there. And, and it will break down the different vaccine types to those that are recommended to receive it. Um, but again, with these references, they do contain a lot of information. So if there's anything that's um, unclear or unsure of, um, just reach out to someone to, to go over that in a bit more detail and just to kind of um, make those recommendations as appropriate. For sure. And on lunghealth.ca slash immunization, we also go over some of the um, some of the recommendations, some of the age groups. Um, so that is a good quick reference. Definitely Health Canada for sure. Um, you know, we we refer back to them quite often as well. I also put into the chat a uh, reference guide to the immunization schedule in Ontario. I couldn't find anything that was specific just to the vaccines that we're talking about. So I put the whole thing in there and then you have to look for the specific one that we're uh, the ones that we're talking about today. Yeah, and that's another point to mention. The provincial recommendations can vary as well from childhood to even publicly funded vaccines later on in life. Um, so that's something you could always consider as well, just the the provincial recommendations. Because I know that shingles is 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 covered in some age groups. Um, so that's also province selective. So if you have any specific questions on additional vaccines, not just the ones we've covered, um, we're here to support with that as well. So great. Well, I think with that, I think we've answered um, our questions within the q and I think we've gotten through most uh, that came in with registration. There were some really, really good ones. So to everyone who provided that um, their questions or gave feedback to the polls, I just want to thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. I hope this was- Wait, Do we have time for one more? I see there's one more in the Q&A. Absolutely. Let's do it. Yeah. So the question is, what is the incidence of Guillain-Barre with Prevnar 20 and RSV vaccines? And I think when people, when when uh, the pharmaceutical companies are developing a new medication, they have to list all of the possible side effects. And so I think that, again, it's probably very low. I don't have a specific percentage. I don't know the number exactly, but it's very low. So all of those things have to be reported um, to the public so that public has has armed knowledge of what they want to do. But the risk of Guillain-Barre is very low. The reason to get a vaccine is much higher. Okay, a little bit of a, a risk, risk reward balance there. Yeah. Um, if someone does want to see those lists of potential side effects, um, where where do they get that information? Under the drug monograph, um, so that could be accessed through the particular manufacturer site or have access and references for things like side effects, um, how common they are. They'll put a percentage down to it in, in most cases where possible. 
certain rare incidences may not be um, there may not be enough data for that, um, but definitely a good reference source if you are worried about particular side effects. Um, just refer to the manufacturer's website and they'll have a, an access to these types of information references. Okay, great. So um, the kind of key phrase there to, to Google is the vaccine name, product monograph, and making sure that you're getting your information from a credible source, like directly from the manufacturer. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these manufacturers will have a, uh, a, a core line as well that you can ring through to to get more specialized or more detailed information. So if that is a particular concern, uh, there will be a, a patient helpline that you could always call through that um, manufacturer and they'll be able to pull out the data that they have from their studies. Such a great resource. Um, I, I didn't even know that, that you could actually call and get like specific mm -hmm. kind of um, information. So really, really helpful stuff because let's face it, there's a lot of misinformation um, floating around online. Certainly in our promotion of this webinar, we saw tons of it. So to be able to pull this group together and answer their questions, really meaningful for me. So I want to thank our speakers so much for providing their expertise. They are both available, um, both through Rexall's Virtual Services and Diane through our Lung Healthline. And if you have any questions after the event, guys, absolutely um, send them into the email um, that you, you know, that um, the registration information came from, and we will try to get you the answers that you need. Yeah, Diane? Sorry, there's one more question. <laughs> oh, you guys, this is wonderful. Okay, I know. what's our next so, question? Uh, this person is asking about the new variant, nothing will show on the test. And why I'm asking is people do volunteer to test before they come, but if if it is not going to give a true reading. And so we go back to the same parameters that we talked about at the beginning of the discussion is that, you know, you know the people who are coming, if they've been tested, it, it, there's, there's a certain amount of acceptance, I guess, that, you know, that they are healthy when they walk through the door. There's no, there's no way that um, something can guarantee that somebody is, isn't going to suddenly become sick while they're there or give it to you and so on. So you do what you can, vaccinate, have, you know, ask other people to vaccinate for the, you know, before they come. If you're concerned about masking, know about the people that are coming into, uh, into your home, um, maybe limit the number of people who are going to be gathering. So those are basically the parameters that we can provide to you at this time. And also, um, from what I've looked into with the uh, variants um, and the actual tests themselves, they should still work for the, the upcoming variants because uh, the base of the test is to uh, account for any changes with time. So they'll look for a, a common um, marker within these um, viruses. So it should still pick up the, the new ones as well because they'll sh all share a, a similar structure. So the thing that is common between them should still be detected within the test. So um, my understanding is that it should still work for the, the variants that are, are being um, in circulation. Um, but if that does ever change, if, if, if that does become a, an issue, then they'll release a new test to kind of prepare for that. So at the moment, I would still use them. Uh, they still show for it. The uh, doctor's offices as well, um, talking from today's experience, my wife was feeling under the weather. She booked for an appointment and they asked specifically, have you tested for COVID? So from that, that will give an indication that they are still testing for it and recommending to test for it if you are under the weather. Great. Okay. Well, I have enjoyed this session. I hope that uh, people have gained you know, some new knowledge. And, and certainly if you have more questions, I'm around on the long line. Give us a call. Wonderful. Well, I wish everyone a really healthy um, rest of December going into the new year. I hope you uh, go into 2024 healthy and protected. And I do always encourage you to reach out to experts like these who can help you get uh, credible information uh, that empowers you to to protect your lung health. So thank you so much and take care everyone. <music>